Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. And I am so happy to have the guest that we have on today because, you know, when you think about people who have, and I'll say it this way in a strange kind of little way, but people who have been through hell and back in a way and continue to move forward, embracing life with the biggest smile that they can have and trying their best to let people know that though we all face tough days. If we look at it the right way, our best days are always in front of us because we have the ability to really determine how we feel and how we act and how we respond to anything that life throws us. And to throw it back at life with a positive look and a positive outlet, that's really what life is all about. That's what living is all about. We've got a very special guest with us today. I've known him now through others for many years, and he was a guest on The Bouncing Act recently. He's born with cystic fibrosis, facing the reality that he might not live into even his 20s. He became a best-selling children's book author as a teenager and was a key ambassador for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And it's truly a miracle that he's here with us today, having now had three separate, listen to me, three separate lung transplants. One of them only about uh, uh, one of which only 30 patients worldwide have had a third procedure. Please welcome to Free Thinking, my friend, author, actor, producer, activist, The Walking Myths Miracle, Mr. Travis Flores. Thank you so much, Travis, for being a part of the show today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Monta. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, my friend. And, you know, I really you know, was looking forward to this interview because um, there are so many people who, especially in the last year in this country and around the world have looked at, you know, COVID and famous families have faced COVID and faced death in their family. But a lot of individuals who not even, never even had the illness have been filled with a life of anxiety and been depressed Mm -hmm. and, you know, they can't seem to get out of their own way because they can't look at tomorrow as maybe possibly being the future. They just look at tomorrow as being, oh, woe is me. And there are people like you, my friend, who have faced your mortality literally almost every day of your life. But you look yeah. at it with a smile. And I try to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's tough for me to even talk to you about how you inspire me and you inspire so many others. So, I mean, let's, let's go back, my my friend, and let me get myself emotionally together. But, you know, your story is so unique that I I, I don't even know where to begin. It's like, how do I ask you, when were you first diagnosed? You were diagnosed, what, about, what, 25 years ago? Um, So I'll be 30 in April. And I was diagnosed at four months old, so 30 years ago. But my wow. prognosis was that I would um, be lucky to live to be five. So we're we're etching on 25 years past what we anticipated as a family. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, what did you feel? But I mean, it's hard to be able to express your feelings, you know, uh, right after birth. But you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you had to recognize, you know, even young, uh, two, three. I don't, I don't know when you're early. It's really funny. I have I have looked back in my life on several occasions and tried to think about things that I did when I was a child and think about my earliest memories. And I have really solid memories of being three years old, four years old. I have solid memories. I remember the look of the room that I was, you know, in when I was a three-year-old. And I remember... You know, one of the things I used to do, it was, it was crazy, used to drive my mother crazy, is I even remember, and I think they took a bottle away from me before I was two. I remember literally sitting in a in a kind of a crib, kind of a bed, and rocketing that bottle out the window. I remember yeah. I got so much fun out of, you know, throwing my bottle out the window from a second story window it would smash on the ground below and my mother coming in and yelling at me. And, you know, I would laugh. I just thought this was the funniest thing in the world. I also remember, you know, when I was two and three years old that I used to like to, and I, I went to the hospital probably once every other week 
Why? Because I would sneak into my mother's room and grab her perfume and I would drink it because I like to go up to people and go, go, and people would smile my breath and go, oh my goodness. So then I have to go get my stomach pumped, right? Like an idiot. But I remember that distinctly. So I, I bet for you, you have memories, you know, age two, age three, or do you, do you ever think about that? Do you ever ponder that that way? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, my, so I have a, an older brother and a younger brother, um, and my parents, we've always been kind of a whole unit, um, my entire life. We're very lucky in that way. A lot of people facing, uh, chronic progressive illnesses fall apart. Um, but our family has almost been strengthened by it, by the, the journey I've been on. Um, and my mom had her own cancer battle. So when I was younger, you know, I knew that going to the hospital was uniquely a thing that I did that my brothers didn't have to do. Um, but my mom and dad always did their best to frame it in a way that was like, uh, I remember Cincinnati Children's being a very large hospital. Um, my uh, mom and dad would say, you have to go to uh, Dr. Evans Castle today. Um, so as a child, I understood the uniqueness of what I was going through. But I think something that I could speak to that a lot of people are experiencing, as you said right now with COVID-19, is this invincibility complex. Um, growing up, you know, I, I knew that cystic fibrosis was a very um, incurable condition. I knew that a lot of people with CF did not survive uh, past the age of adulthood into later years. Some, some people didn't survive through their teen years. So I was very aware of that, but I almost didn't believe that, you know, you have that, well, that's not going to be me thing. And what I found very quickly over the last, um, I'd say several years, is that I'm not invincible and that one day I will die and I will likely die young. Um, and there's a beauty that comes with that. And that's one, I take extreme caution and care for others, uh, not just myself. Because while I'm here, I feel a deep responsibility to do my part to ensure that the world for my baby niece and my future nieces and nephews will be safe. Um, and I think a lot of people right now are going through this, as you said, depression and sadness of, of losing their normalcy. And I've been through that multiple times. I mean, COVID-19 in particular, people who, who get the condition and people who see people go through the condition are going to be facing things like looking at a flight of stairs and feeling that it's an enemy, like stairs are a villain because you can't walk up a flight of stairs because breathing has become a challenge. Um, that has been the case for me um, progressively over the course of my life. And with the first double lung transplant in 2015, we just past six years, um, I felt this renewal, this sense of hope. Um, my breath was taken from me again due to chronic organ rejection. And then again, after the second transplant, I kind of understood that I'm not invincible. So when I think back to being a child, what I, what I miss the most and what I remember the most is not being um, aware of my own mortality. Um, and now I fully am. I am fully aware of my own mortality. I am absolutely thankful that UCLA and, um, you know, there's uh, Dr. Ross, Dr. Saya, um, and Dr. Arta Holly at UCLA all came together and decided um, with another doctor, Dr. Way, to move forward on a third double lung transplant to save my life. But I was already in the process of kind of reflecting a lot on my younger years, as you said. And that was something that stuck out to me when I talked to my family about it was, man, I just miss feeling like the world was 
in the palm of my hand, like I could do anything. Um, well, let's but, let's make, let me stop you for a quick second because I think mm-hmm. let's make sure people understand what is cystic fibrosis. I've I've you know back when I had my mm-hmm. show, I interviewed several survivors um, who were surviving at the time, and again, unfortunately, a lot of them have passed away. Um, but explain to our viewers what 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 is cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is a condition that uh, severely affects the lungs and the digestive system. So it becomes incredibly hard to gain weight. And then when you get infections, the mucus in your lungs is very thick. So the combination of not having weight to fight the infection and then the mucus not being easy to get out, um, you almost become a human Petri dish. Like things just keep growing and they become resistant to medications. And right now there's all this talk in the news about variants. And that is something that the CF community is constantly faced with, you know, like what new bacteria is going to morph into a resistant superbug. And if that superbug gets into our lungs, how do we fight that? Um, So CF, you know, it's, it's a difficult illness to live with. Luckily today, there's a lot more research that has gone into it. There's a lot more medications for the younger generation, but Growing up with CF in my generation, it was very, very complex and difficult. And and you know now we you felt the effects of the mucus buildup at age two, three, four, right. five, six, seven. Um, I I started to really feel the effects at like age probably eight. That's when I started getting hospitalized really frequently. Um, and by the time I was fifteen. Um, I had my first incident where I coughed up blood. And as a teenager, um, when you just want to live your life and you do something like cough up blood, um, it really brings a perspective into like, oh, my life is definitely not like my friends. Like, it's not just about going to the hospital occasionally for IV medications. It's the fact that my lungs are destroyed mm-hmm. now you know and 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 what was it like you know among your peers i mean it, it, tell me what it's like you're going to elementary school then you're in junior high school you're 15 you're in high school i mean did your peers know what you were going through my closest friends definitely did um i think that we all had an understanding that oh travis has to go to the hospital for IV medication he'll be back soon Um, I recently had a conversation with one of my best friends uh, from home, um, Alicia, who has been through my entire life with me, basically with cystic fibrosis and watched me go through every transplant and every rejection. And before the third transplant was approved, she said that she had a moment where she was realizing, oh, he might not bounce back this time. And she said that was the first time for her in her entire life with me where she actually realized cystic fibrosis is, is serious. Like, cause I always bounce back. Mm -hmm. And now you're 30 now. So you had your first lung transplant six years ago, right? Yeah. uh, March uh, 3rd, 2015. Yeah. 2015 and you were uh, 24, 23 years old what was, was it like, like 24 yeah 24 so okay so between 15 that first incident of throwing up blood and, and actually coughing up blood mm-hmm. and then you know 24 what was life like in that nine-year period of time you know my my again my family has always been so incredibly supportive so when i was 15 i was just finishing up a three-year book tour of my children's book and uh, I immediately, when I coughed up blood, I was like, oh, I need to keep going in life. Like I need to keep moving forward. I can't stop because I don't know if I'll have an entire life to live. And what, wait, what was that um, children's book about? What was your children's book about? So the children's book was about this little spider, uh, that perseveres to spin a web. Um, and I wrote it when I was eight in the, in the children's hospital, meeting kids that were sick for the first time. And it really freaked me out. Um, so I took this idea of something I was terrified of, which is spiders to this day, 
um, and made it into something positive. And then it was published uh, with the help of Make-A-Wish and we donated uh, all the proceeds back to charity. Um, wow. But yeah, it was, it was a three year book tour. And uh, I immediately, when I came off the book tour and I had the incident with the hemoptysis of coughing up blood, I decided I wanted to try to test into college. Um, and luckily my high school was supportive of a program that did that. Um, so I went to college full time starting at 16. Wow. Um, and by the, yeah, and by the time I was 19 turning 20, I had already moved to New York city and was graduating with my bachelor's and got into NYU, uh, for a master's degree in fundraising and grant making. Um, so I, by the time I was 21 turning 22, I had obtained a master's degree from NYU um, wow. because it was just important to me to like live life and do all of these things that I might not get to do. Um, and I, and I'm very proud of that. So life was fairly like normal and fun and exciting and adventurous for a long time. I mean, living in New York city is a, it's an animal. Um, right. And then moving to Los Angeles after graduating with my, uh, master's degree that's when things started to decline really really fast um and is that that's relations. normal that's normal for the disease right in the early 20s i mean every case is different that's why cf is so hard to kind of predict because you know if you get um uh, MRSA um and it's you know a really dangerous bacteria it's going to affect you and if somebody else happens to live their entire life without getting MRSA they might have healthier lungs for longer um in my case uh I had just had um a slow decline over living in New York um I think the stress of being in a big city like that definitely impacted it but I was I was walking a lot so I felt the exercise was really good um, but I'll say the really steep decline that happened, um, I went through a heartbreak. Uh, and after five years with someone, when they leave you, um, it's difficult, especially when you have a chronic progressive terminal condition. Like, it makes you feel like you'll never find love again. Um, I luckily have found love, to love again. I'm very fortunate. But that was kind of like a big, turning point in my life was uh losing that support wow and so again so it takes us up to you know the first transplant I mean, when the doctor said to you look and i, I gotta tell you that would be an a immensely profound you know prognosis of a doctor walked up to me and said montal we're gonna have to do a double lung transplant you go what yeah. excuse me yeah i mean this is the time when you know we're you know, there are people were probably looking at that as being, you know, not experimental, but just beyond being experimental. So, you know, what was that like when you were told, I'm, I'm going to, you're going to need a double lung transplant? You know, honestly, I will tell you, um, I, I had been with a, uh, with a doctor for a while, uh, who was using the term end stage cystic fibrosis a lot to me and uh it every time sorry i got choked up every time i would lose my color uh because that is not reaffirming to the fact that i can survive um so when i finally left that facility and i went to ucla and i met with dr uh, ross for the first time he comes in and he sits down after looking at my CT scan and he just goes, eh, you're ready for transplant. And I was like, this, this seems really casual. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't really know how to respond to that. And I said, I don't want you to ever say end stage CF to me. Please never say that. Like if we're going to move forward, I'm happy to fight and I will, and I'll do my best, but please don't say that. And he looks me just dead in the eye. And he goes, this is not end stage Travis Flores. This is end stage cystic fibrosis. This is the end of your illness. We're going to give you new lungs. You're going to feel amazing. You're going to do 
all the things that you didn't get to do and feel that breath that you've never been able to feel. So this is not end stage, Travis Morris. And just, and just, then, just, just to understand, because, because cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So it's, it's, it's embedded in your DNA. Would the new lungs have the propensity to, or, or is there a possibility that you would, even with the new set of lungs, continue to develop cystic fibrosis? Do you know what I mean? I've never understood that. No. Yeah. And that was actually a learning curve for me as well. So, um, you know, you grow up with CF and you're told to stay six feet apart from people that the whole six foot rule that everyone's freaking out about. That's our life. Like that's our community mm-hmm. wearing masks. Mm-hmm. That's our life. We don't mm-hmm. know any different. Um, so when you're transplanted, you don't have that DNA of CF in those lungs anymore. Got it. Um, and when that happens, it's kind of a beautiful thing. So any CF patients that have been transplanted are now able to be around each other. So there were friends that I had never been allowed to hug before, um, that all of a sudden we were able to embrace each other because we were both post transplant. Got it. And, and, you know, now you, your first new set of lungs you had for what, about a year, year and a half and doing very well, right? Initially. So, yeah, so I had the first set of lungs for two years, seven months, um, and then I was transplanted again on October third, two thousand seventeen. Well, well, tell me then, um, uh, you transplanted the second time because your immune system was rejecting the first set of lungs, right? Yeah, so, my body was attacking them. Yeah. So that that had to put you through a whole different set of symptoms. What was that like? Um. Montel, you're going to make me cry. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, it's it's fine. It's it's really cathartic to reflect on this sometimes, um, and it's humbling. So when you have CF, the way I describe it to somebody uh, is it's like being in an airplane. You know how to control it if you're the pilot, and you just have to get to that runway. You just got to land the plane, and then you get your transplant. With rejection... I was on a plane, I had no control over it, and it was nose diving. And I went from being able to breathe to within a matter of months, having 15% pulmonary lung function, which is death. Like you can't, you can't breathe. Um, And you feel that with cystic fibrosis, it's a slow decline, you know, Um, you don't necessarily feel it until right at the end um but this it was immediate like i went from being a normal person um having my first date with my now partner to just a couple months later in the hospital chest tubes are in me being told i might not survive um it's difficult yeah and you had just you said you just gone on your first date with your partner I mean, you were trying to start a new life, start a new relationship, move forward that way. How tough was that? Um, even on this person, now that of course your partner doesn't have CF, right? No, he does not. Um, you know, I had been on a slew of really bad dates up to that date. And it was one of those things where I felt like I had to hide this big part of myself that I was in rejection. Um, because who wants to start a relationship with someone that might not be around? Um, so I, I sat down with him at this restaurant uh, in Hollywood called birds. And I, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to tell him everything on the first date. And if he sticks around, then he's the one. And if he doesn't, what do I lose? Like, whatever. So I did, I just unloaded everything onto him. Um, and he just kind of stared at me, (laughs) Um, not really knowing what to say. Um, And then we went our separate ways and he kind of, I felt like friends on me. He he denies that, but I feel, I feel he friends on me uh, Mm -hmm. for a couple months, but he was the first person. Now, mind you, I only met him one time. The night I went into UCLA, uh, September 1st, a couple months after the first date, it was awful. My mom was with me. 
they had to put chest tubes in me without any kind of sedation because it was an emergency. Um, and she asked me something that was traumatic for her, I'm sure, which was, can you please share something on your social media about what's going on? Because if you don't survive, Travis, I can't do it. Like, and I, and I didn't want her to have to do that. So I shared something and my partner um, texted me and showed up at the ER that night. Uh, and that was our second date. <laughs> wow. Um, but, it, but it was one of those things where he was kind of understandably resistant. You know, he came to visit me every day waiting for that second trance when he was there. Every night, watched movies with me, kept me entertained, like really kept my mind off the fact that I was actively dying. And um, he, after, after the second transplant, um, when we started dating, I remember asking him, like, why, why did you kind of disappear for a minute there? There was a few months after the first date where I didn't hear from you much. And he goes, you needed a nurse, not a boyfriend. Right. <laughs> and, right. I, and I don't blame him. Like, he, he was right. I, did, I needed someone to care for me in a medical way more than I needed love in that moment. And, and th that when you went to the emergency room, that was to actually keep you alive right. until you got a second set of lungs, right? Yeah. Um, and what's, so, and what's and how, did, how did doctor, I, I'm just trying to, to go through this with you, Travis, because I, I don't really, and I know that a lot of people who are watching don't understand this whole process either. I mean, so you get your first set of lungs, and the first set, your body rejects. I guess it would be tough to convince a doctor to give you a second set or to put you in a list yeah. since you rejected the first set because there's so many other people waiting for a first set. Um, what was going through your mind and going through the doctors and the conversations that you were having? Were you immediately put on a list to get a second set? Um, no. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important for me to to make this really clear to everyone who watches or listens to this. Um, I struggle every day with um, survivor's guilt because, because of exactly what you said, which is there are people that are waiting for transplants who um, are not able to get them in time. And who am I to ask for a redo and then a redo um, when these people are suffering the same? Um, but, but, but I, I, mean, spent, it, it, I mean, I'm sorry, just on that comment alone, but the fact that they did a do the first time and the do didn't work the first time the correct way should not make you feel as if you don't deserve a redo because, you know, it's like, um, you know, if I go and buy a brand new car and take it home and that car, you know, craps out, which it happens quite a bit and has to be recalled, the manufacturer has to give me a new car. And, you know, whether people like it or not, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't give me a new car and go give it to somebody who doesn't have a car. You know, you got to right. compensate me for the one that you gave me. Yeah. And I think, in that scenario, it makes a lot more sense when you put it that way. I think the, the the hard thing is that there's simply no way to know if the rejection happened. Um, if the rejection happened because of anything I did, or if it happened because of anything external, like there's no way to know. Um, and I was very young. So, and my work in the community, you know, I was working actively with Donate Life, with Make-A-Wish, with the CF Foundation, with, with charities. Like, I was working hard to help others. And you've and, raised um, millions of dollars for the CF charity, have you not? Uh, for CF and Make-A-Wish, yeah, together Make between um, the last 20 years of speaking and helping donors, uh, find it within themselves to write checks. Yeah. Um, I've helped them raise a lot. And make a wish. I mean, I know you are an ambassador for make a wish. So, you know, we applaud Love you. My friend. Wish. 
I will applaud you so much for all that you've done for so many others. So, you know, I mean, I, I, if I can help, you know, just in, in, in deep in your heart of heart, just know that, you know, the hard work you've done makes you deserving of us to want to keep you around as long as we can have you help you, and you know, the, continue with, what you're doing. Huh? With the, with the third transplant, because it was such a rare procedure and because again, there was that moral dilemma of who, who am I, who, like there are other people that need lungs. What it really came down to was a couple things. Um, one, I have helped to secure about 100,000 organ donor registrations now um, through my work with Donate Life, which I'm very proud of. Um, two, after speaking in depth with um, the surgeons and the um, various people that were making those decisions on whether or not to proceed with the third transplant, it was very clear to me that the set of lungs that would be offered to me may not be offered to anyone else if I said no. You know, it's a, it is a real match that they have to find. It's like tissue, blood, size. Like, it's not like a pair of lungs becomes available and they say, oh, Travis gets them. Um, it, it's a real science to it. So if I were to say, no, I don't want to do a third transplant, that doesn't mean these lungs would have match someone else in the California region. Right. Um, and so then, that, but, that was really a determining factor. And while you're talking about that, let, let's start with, so that you get the first set, then you go to the hospital. That's when your, uh, your partner comes in and, and basically helps you through the first or the, the first redo. The rejection. And how long yeah. did the, the second set last? So, that is such an interesting question that you asked because I was about to say that um, the last thing that I really needed for my own uh, well-being and my own mental health was, I remember asking the universe, I said, please give me a sign that the third transplant can do better. Like, I don't want to go through all of this pain to just another two, another year like i why put off my family grieving when when they don't need to i mean we could just do it now we could just be done and so when i listed that was the one thing i had to put out into the universe i said please show me that the third can do better than the second that you know please that call for this transplant these lungs that i have right now i call them my forever lungs um that call came two years, seven months, one day. So the wow. first transplant lasted two years, seven months. This call literally two years, seven months, one day. That's crazy. And now that second rejection, um, was it similar to the first one? I mean, did, did you go, did you stay, was there a moment that you woke up and go, Oh no, is this happening again? Um, no, the second rejection, um, I don't know if this will make sense to people, but I'll say I'll say it anyway. The second rejection was more spiritual for me. Um, the the first transplant, I did not know my donor family. I sent a letter to them. They received it. They didn't respond. And, and that's OK. The second transplant, I sent a letter and my donor family responded. Uh, we met on my donor's 36th birthday, um, and I blew out his birthday candles with his lungs. It was a really beautiful moment. Um, and then over the course of that time with those lungs, the family and I became incredibly close to the point that I, to this day, I call Aldo's sister, my sister, his mom, my mom, um, and they refer to me as such as well. Um, but Aldo was taken by force of somebody else. And there was a trial and I went and I sat in that trial and I watched that person get convicted. And when that happened, it was almost this sense of peace that came over all of us. Um, 
And it was around that time that I started rejecting. And you knew you were it's, it's very strange. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was pretty apparent. Um, it did not feel the same because it wasn't this nosedive effect. It was kind of like I could sense something was wrong. I kept saying I felt something was wrong. Um, and then when we found out something was wrong, I declined pretty quickly. Um, uh, but the lungs, you know, I, I say it to this day, all those lungs were so incredibly strong because I stayed at about 12% lung function, sometimes dipping to 9% lung function, which is dead basically. Like it's worse than the cystic fibrosis lung function. Um, but I stayed at that lung function for over a year Wow! Um, into the pandemic. Like it, like those lungs lasted all the way into the beginning of the pandemic. And, and, and I, I guess had the that, transplant in the middle of it. Wow. And I guess that that was, you know, when you went and saw the doctors, the doctors, were they reticent to put you on a list for a third set? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, that was an incredibly emotional conversation. Um, Dr. Ross, who is no longer at UCLA, sat down with uh, my partner, my mom and I, and you have to remember this man has been through two transplants with me and has carried me when I have fallen. Um, so for him to come in and have to tell me it's chronic rejection and we're sorry, like we don't typically do third transplants. The last third transplant UCLA did, didn't do well. Um, and I remember having this moment of realization, like he's in a way telling me like, at this point, it's about comfortable. It's about being comfortable. I'm going to die. And I just lost it. I, I started sobbing and I said, um, please, I'll do anything. Like I've given my life to helping others. Please, I need help. And he said, it's not about that. It's about the fact that we just simply don't do that. Um, but he did help me prepare a case to take to Duke University in North Carolina. Duke pretty immediately rejected me, um, which was upsetting because they, they've done the most third transplants in the country. Um, they had their reasons. They never met with me. Uh, they made the decision solely based on paper. Um, and when that happened, um, I sent a video begging for my life to multiple hospitals, including UCLA. And UCLA responded back um, and said, come back home. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. And when, when they said that, it was like, okay, we're going to, this isn't a yes, but it's the first step to like, fighting for my life. Um, and I had to mentally kind of put myself back into that. Like I had to say, okay, we're going to do this again. I have to go through this again. My chest is, my chest is going to be cracked open again, but I had to look at it as positive things, which sounds crazy to those people. Like I had to say, like, I am grateful and excited that my chest is going to be cracked open again. And like, that's not typically something somebody says, um, but I had to be in that mindset to get through the process of evaluation. So I, I went back to UCLA, we started the evaluation, UCLA was on board. Uh, they, you know, the surgeon said yes, the pulmonologist said yes, the nurses, everyone was on board. Um, they were ready to take this task on because the third transplant is Come, it, it comes with complications. It's just expected. Um, and then my insurance company said no. And I remember thinking, who the hell are they? If I'm willing to fight for my life and they're willing to fight for my life, for them to say, we're not paying for it. So I had to immediately switch paths and switch hospitals um, for the insurance to go through a different hospital so that hospital could say yes to send me back to UCLA. And 
the first day back at that other hospital, we had a great appointment, Montel. It went really well. And I was excited. I was like, okay, we're going to streamline this. I was in a crosswalk and I got hit by a car. Oh, no. And I fractured my spine in five places. Oh. And immediately I remember thinking, this could be it. Like, why would they open up my front and break my bones in my front when my spine is now broken? Um, and when I got to the hospital, the doctor said, we don't know how quickly we can get you walking. And your lungs are so severely diminished that it's likely you could develop pneumonia and this would be it. And I remember looking at that ER doctor and I said, watch me. And within 24 hours, I was up walking. And it was a longer recovery. Like it took about four months, four or five months in a back brace. Um, and I was still doing my speaking engagement, still traveling and helping the charities I care deeply for um, in the back brace. Uh, but by the time I was finally sent back to UCLA, um, it was just a matter of waiting for that right moment because they want to, they don't want to transplant you when you're stable, if that makes sense. Like they don't want to transplant you when the lungs you have could last longer because if they transplant you, the clock starts ticking again. So they want to give you as much time possible. So I, by the time I was sent back to UCLA, it was around October 2019. Um, I didn't get listed until April 2020. Um, and that was, again, a very strategic decision. Um, we waited until I uh, was clearly going to die. Um, and then a couple weeks later on May uh, fourth, I went into the hospital, and on May fifth, um, on Cinco de Mayo, um, my transplant happened, and that makes sense because my second donor was Spanish. So, wow, well, I mean, it just it just seems like I mean, how how perfect a set of circumstances because then you know you had to go through not only the donor lungs had to match specifically perfectly for you to be able to go through the third one, right? Yeah. Yeah, they had to be really matched to me. And there's actually video um, of that phone call because I had never been able to capture the call when it comes for the transplant. And it's such a powerful moment for people to see. Um, and I don't think I've ever posted it. I've yet to actually share it online. Um, but I saw my phone ring at 10 o'clock at night on May 4th. And I looked at my mom, we made eye contact. I looked at my partner and I said, get your camera. So he got his camera and I picked up him on speaker. Uh, and they said, is this Travis Flores? And I said, yes. She goes, this is the transplant coordinator. And then she continued to say like, we have a set of lungs for you, do you accept? And I said, yes. And I look at the camera and I said, two years, seven months. Wow. Like that day, the whole day I was telling my mom, I was like, mom, tomorrow is the two years, seven months, one day we beat it. We beat the second transplant Wow. Um, or the first transplant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so now what's the prognosis now? So I am, uh, I am in a situation that I haven't been in in a long time and it's called stability. <laughs> Um, I, I had an appointment yesterday. Uh, things are great, Montel. Like I, you know, I gained, I've gained weight. When I went into that surgery, I was about a hundred pounds, which is really scary when you're, you know, five, nine, five, eight. Um, it's very low BMI and now I'm up, uh, 30 pounds or so. And I feel really good. My lungs feel amazing. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's been weird. Like with the pandemic recovery has been very different this time around. Um, for instance, even just going in for the surgery, my family had to just drop me off at the ER. They were not allowed to go in. Um, so we set our CU outside the hospital. Um, and then 
the recovery of a transplant, let alone a third one, is incredibly painful, incredibly hard. Um, and you wake up on a breathing machine. Uh, I understand all these people that are going through COVID waking up in shock on a ventilator. I get it. Um, but you, but I had to do that like everyone else is doing it right now, which is by yourself without family. Um, I had the benefit of having been on a ventilator many times. Um, and I also had the benefit that the ICU staff has become family um, in a weird, unfortunate, but fortunate way. Um, so I felt like I was very comforted by family in a way. Um, but then after I got out of the hospital, recovery is very different. Um, in the previous transplants, they encourage you, go outside, you know, do as much exercise as you can, be out, do hiking on the beach, doing whatever it is. And this time it was very much like, you need to really be careful of where you go. You need to exercise, but try to do it inside for a while um, because you're severely, severely depleted of immune um, system capabilities right after your transplant. And you continue to be on immune suppressing drugs. So the pandemic right now, I mean, for my community and many other communities of immune suppressed individuals it is terrifying. I mean, it must, you must literally want to punch the television and punch out people when you hear these buttheads out here talking about they don't want to wear a mask. They don't recognize how they could kill you. Yeah. Um, uh, it's one of those things where I absolutely understand the need and want to get back to, to normalcy in their life. Um, what I can't stand is when people complain about how they can't breathe with a mask on. Um, that really bothers me because I had a mask on with literally no lung function and wearing oxygen under the mask and still wearing the mask and still being able to breathe despite the fact that I was suffocating internally. Didn't matter if I took the mask off, I was suffocating. So that that upsets me a lot. And then also people complaining about the six foot rule. Um, I cannot tell you how many moments in my life not just with other CF individuals, but family and loved ones when they are sick or they sneeze or they have a little cold where I have to say, I can't, like, I can't be around you. I love you. Happy birthday, happy anniversary, happy whatever occasion that I have to miss. That has been 30 years of my life. So what I said on the balancing act, if you remember, is we can wear a mask just a little bit longer. Like, that will you can take off your mask when the pandemic is over, but guess what? I still have to wear mine, and my community still has to wear theirs, and we do it to protect ourselves from you, not the other way around. We're not we're not like shielding what we have, you know, to get to you. We are terrified of people giving something to us. Um, so when people complain about not wanting to wear a mask, it's like. It's so selfish Yes. Uh, when, when there's so many of us that would do anything to be able to not have to wear a mask on an 80 degree beautiful day in Los Angeles. And yet we do, and we always have, and we always will. Um, it's just how we have to live. That is our normal. And again, I understand my normal is not somebody else's normal. Three double lung transplants and a year, of, uh, a lifetime of CF, it's not normal. But there are little things that we can do during this abnormal time to make things a little normal in the future for everyone else again. Absolutely. And you know, now there's this again, the third set of lungs. I mean, your prognosis is you could live now for the next 20 years this way, right? I mean, as long as there's no rejection. I hope so. Right. I hope so, man. That's the goal. Like, 
I've had that conversation. My new doctor now at UCLA, uh, Dr. Ross has left, but Dr. Saya has this way of, um, and Dr. Arda Holly, the surgeon, they both have this way of saying things to me that I think they realize push me. When somebody says to me, you can't, that doesn't fly. Like when somebody says like, oh, you can't go to grad school at 19, 20 years old. I'm like, okay. When somebody says you can't walk after fracturing your spine, I'm like, yeah, okay. So when the doctors were saying like, don't expect your lung function to be better than it was with the second transplant, because this is a third. There's a lot of scar tissue. Your body's been through a lot. Um, so they gently just don't expect. And I'm like, okay, like that's, that's irritating. I accept what you're saying, but I don't accept that that's my case. Um, and it's not denial, it's motivation for me. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, my pulmonary function now is about 15% higher than anyone anticipated. Um, and, and they continue to say, well, don't expect it to get higher. And I think that they've tapped into that with me. I think that they've realized, oh, who's telling you can? <laughs> well, look, Danny, I'm going to run out of time here real quick. And I know that it's really important to you to reach out to people and tell them to make sure that they, you know, are signing up to be, you know, potential donors. Why don't you share that yeah. message and let me know where, let people know where they can go to do so. So, um, First of all, an organ donor can save up to eight lives. I think that's incredibly important to know. Um, and countless other people can be helped by an organ donor through other tissues, uh, from the eyes and various parts of the body. Um, and becoming an organ donor has become increasingly easy, um, even before the pandemic. And I don't think people realize that. You can sign up to be an organ donor on your phone, on your iPhone. You go to the health app, you click on your medical ID and you can literally sign up right there to become an organ donor. I love that Apple's done that. Um, I don't know if Android has. Um, I assume that they would they would be doing something similar. Um, so you don't have to go wait in line at your uh, local DMV. You can do it on your phone. And the way I put it to people is it's a very personal decision. Um, I cannot tell someone to go be an organ donor. All I can do is say that at the end of your life, uh, whenever that may be, you have the absolute potential to save other lives. And could you imagine if you were in need of an organ of some kind and your life depended on it and you were watching your family watch you die, would you not want somebody to save your life? And of course you would. So it's, it's just, it's a matter of paying it forward. You know, when you move on from this life, you move on from this life. That doesn't mean you can't still benefit other people. Absolutely, my friend. Well, look, I can't say thank you enough, Travis, for being a part of Free Thinking Today. I know that you've inspired millions. I, 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 and, and you'll inspire thousands, hundreds of thousands through, you know, my social media um, outlets and, and I can't say thank you enough for being a part of the show today. Sure, I, you inspire me. Yeah, thank you, Montel. I've been watching uh, your shows and and whatnot for as long as I can remember. Like uh, my mom and I have been huge, huge fans of you, and your medical journey has inspired my parents to um, instill in me that uh, I can pursue whatever career I want. Um, just because I have an illness doesn't mean it's limiting in, um, in my future. I just got to be smart about it. Absolutely. Well, look, you know what? Um, I've had a saying my uh, entire journey with MS is that, you know, I have MS. MS will never have me. And you've proven that, you know, though you may have CF, CF will never have you, my friend. And so thank yeah. you for all the hope that you give to so many um, keep doing what you're doing with the Make a Wish Foundation and helping to raise awareness for donor, um, for uh, you know potential donors. And um, anytime you ever want to come back here, you always have a home here. Free thinking, okay? Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, a very special, you know, uh, you know, wish for your partner for staying with you and and 
and help him to keep you in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's uh, he's one of the strongest people that I have ever had the fortune of coming into contact with. Absolutely. All right, sir. So you take care. You be well. Make sure you stay safe. And let's hope that people Me out there too. understand that you never know. I mean, if I look at you by mail, I'm looking at you. I don't know what's going on with you. I couldn't see CF on your face. So how dare someone decide to take a mask off and and walk around a person that they don't know what's going on? And, you know, your maskless face could end up causing this young man his life and costing him his life. So I'm on a tirade, my friend. I I, I don't think that uh, it's time for us to give up. I don't think it's time for us to think that we've beaten this. We haven't beaten this, and we don't know what the next pandemic is going to be. So we need to pay attention to mitigation techniques from this point forward. This is what the world is going to be like. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a bad place. It's just a place that we have to be cautious in. Yeah, I thank you for being here. The little steps we can take, like wearing a mask, can make all the difference in the world. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. So thank you again for being a part of Free Thinking with Montel. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thanks for joining me on Free Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please send us your comments.